Welcome back. Globalisation, technological development, changes in the very nature of work, these are all elements that contribute to the competitive pressure that's shaping and changing the future of small business in this country. Some of these changes will provide incredible opportunities, but some are set to provide significant threats and risks. Some of the changes will enable small business to work with and compete on more even footing, perhaps, with larger businesses. At the end of this month, the NAB National Small Business Summit will be held in Sydney and Dr Paul Higgins, a core consultant at Emergent Futures and a futurist, uh, he'll be speaking at the summit and he joins us now live from Melbourne. Dr Higgins, thanks so much for joining us. Now, this future competitive landscape for small business, it can be very daunting and you call this a double-edged sword. What do you mean? Good evening, Helen. I think uh, I call it a double-edged sword because there's going to be huge opportunities but the same things which are going to drive those opportunities are going to open up small business to more competition and significant threat and risk at the same time. Like what? What do you mean? Well, we like to say that uh, these things are really driven by the three T's, so technology, trust and transparency. And trust is the key, po key component that holds the whole thing together. The technology opens up connections, provides the capability, the pipes, the connections, all those sort of things. But the social change and social trust that laid on top of that causes real structural change in small business. Yeah, so what do you so mean like about to, trust? Sorry. Are you talking about the trust between a small business and its, um, it, the community it serves, its customers? I'm talking about the trust between the customers and that small business, but also between the customers of that small business, which is where the technology, the social networks are changing things. And as an example, uh, recently a company started called Gripe in the United States, and on that you can put a complaint on about uh, the service that a small business or a large business gives to you. And so what, it's a website who, called Gripe? Gripe, yes, yeah. it's G-R-I-P-E. <laughs> of course, And a consultant a I worked with in the, in the, yeah, the United <laughs> States, um, he put a complaint on there about Disney, where he stayed at their hotel. And they, uh, he put that up and it was influencing 487,000 people through the people that, he, that follow him on Twitter and other social networks. So that public complaint is going out to a huge number of customers and the same thing is going to happen to small business. And what happened, say, in that case? Do you, did you follow that through? Do you know whether Disney responded? Are, are big companies like Disney you know, looking at that social media and, and as, I'm, as we know, a number of companies in Australia already are and saying, ah, oh, we've got a problem here, we've got to fix this? Yeah, this is one of these reasons that I'm saying this is both a, an opportunity but also a risk. So small businesses can suffer from this, but they can also benefit. So if a customer makes a complaint and you provide fantastic service and solve that customer's problem, then that goes out to a huge number of people. The reverse also happens if that complaint is not resolved or is not looked after properly, then that same influence, that negative image, goes out to a huge number of people as well. And it's not enough for small business just to say, well, you know, some customers complain, uh, I won't participate in that process. The reality is that conversation will go on whether small business engages in it or not. So I'm recommending they engage in it and really, really provide excellent customer service. All right. Well, now, I mean, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate here. A lot of small business people are so snowed under with running their business, trying to uh, interact with the customers they have in a face-to-face -face sense. How do they get onto social media and monitor that? They don't have the deep pockets and the, the huge numbers of staff who can monitor that. Well, I, I run a small business uh, myself, obviously, in our consulting business, and, and we use those tools all the time. And the reality is that small business may be snowed under and are madly, frantically busy every day, but unless they get engaged in these processes, it's going to bypass them and cause them problems. Right, so you so don't want those do, negative sorry, do, messages there. How do they do that, Paul Higgins? 
Well, there, there are a whole range of techniques that can be used. So, for example, uh, there are social sites for, say, if you look at cafes, things like Urban Spoon or Yelp, where you can participate in the process. You can search for your own company and see what comments are being made and do that. You can respond to customer complaints and post up yourself when you've resolved them, so that spreads out to other people. You can ask your customers to spread the message when you provide excellent customer service for them, so use your networks and what you're already doing well to do the work for you rather than spend a huge amount of time doing it yourself. All right, just back to that example that you gave about somebody complaining about a, a massive company like Disney. Would, uh, do people, I mean, we know they complain about small businesses, but generally that might be in a smaller circle to their family and friends. Will small business be at the same risk of being kind of outed for some perceived wrongdoing as larger businesses? Oh, absolutely. These networks are growing. And I use the example where small business, again, going to the cafe or restaurant or coffee shop example, is competing with the larger chain, say McDonald's or something like that. If you take your family to Bendigo or Perth or Adelaide, one of the attractions about going to those large chains is you know what will be there. You know the standard of service you'll get, you know the food you'll get. And you're more likely to go there than take a chance on another place, particularly if you've got kids and they're fussy and those sort of things. But in that same place, same Bendigo, if you go there and you can access a social network that you trust, then you'll take recommendations from that network and there's a lot more chance you'll go and attend that private local coffee shop than the major chains. So it gives those people a competitive advantage against the major chains and I, I'm, I'm recommending people should jump into it. You're, you've, so you've just highlighted some of the risks that globalisation and sort of new technology present to small business. What are some of the other risks? Well, an example is uh, uh, crowdsourcing. So, for example, my brother runs a small business, a risk management consulting business, and recently he's had built for him software applications uh, looking at risk management diagnosis and tools. Now, the way he did that was he posted that job on a website called Elance, and Elance people Elance as bidded. in freelance, but it's electronic Lance. Yes. So, yes. So there's also one called Freelancer. And he posted that job up there with the specifications and he was able to get those software applications built for him by a software developer in Canada. And that system's a bit like, say, people would know eBay. The people who provide the services get rated and get customer feedback on that system and also the people that put up jobs get rated and it becomes a bit of a community. So it's, now he's also... Sorry, uh, sorry, Paul Higgins, so it's like a sort of a, um, a hiring site for project people. That's correct. And so he was able to do that and he's looking now to get iPad and iPhone applications built by the same person. Now that opens up a whole world for him, capabilities he doesn't have internally but is still a small business and, and possibly a whole global market because if what he builds actually works, other risk management consultants, other businesses around, around the whole world might use it. But the reverse is true. There's probably a thousand people out there building applications, trying to do things which will impinge on his business, who are coming back the other way at him. So it's a double-edged sword. So how will these sorts of changes enable small business to better compete with larger businesses? Uh, well, for example, uh, the, we are using in our business uh, outsourcing to uh, an Indian company called Brickwork in Bangalore in India. And we were able to hire people there, which we do on a, on a permanent basis. But what they do within their system is they barter for services internally as well. So they provide a range of services to us. But if we ask for a job from them that they can't do, they can take it to one of the internal employees there and barter their time. They say, Helen, I have got this job I can't do, but I can do jobs for you. Can we barter and swap our time? That enables small business to get hold of a whole range of skills that they couldn't otherwise have inside their organisations. And it's like having 20 employees by just hiring one. So that gives you huge competitive abilities we didn't have five years ago. Do you think small business, even the tiniest number of them, know about many or any of these sorts of websites and the, the, the kind of services that really that are available to them? 
I think the word's starting to get out there. If, for example, I went to Elance today just to check on it before this interview, and they're closing in now on $400 million worth of business being transacted on that website between small business people and project people. So it's starting to grow. But these technologies and these connections are going to evolve at, at, at a mad rate in the next decade. I'm fond of Gary Hamill's quote, which is, somewhere out there in a garage, there's an entrepreneur forging a bullet with your business's name on it. And these things are going to happen in wave after wave after wave. So I'm recommending to small business that they have to get engaged in this process. I know they're very busy every day. They, there's not enough hours in the day. But they have to look up a bit more and find out what's going on and changing, because otherwise they might look up and find that train's about two feet from their, from their business and they can't do anything about it. All right. And do you say that they need not be overwhelmed by doing all this stuff? I first of all think they don't have a choice uh, and there are plenty of ways to get so help out there. they have to do it or get left behind? Yeah, I think these, these changes are going to expose them to a lot more risk than they currently have. They're still going to have all the other problems they've had day to day, but global competition, outsourcing from people who are going to be competing with them, all these cost reductions are going to compete with them as well. So they have to have a go at these things, otherwise I believe they're in serious trouble. All right, it's been most interesting talking to you, Paul Higgins. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Helen. And coming up, we look at a new concept that's giving companies the opportunity to drive their businesses through moving advertising campaigns you'll see in a moment. But first, here's how the blue chips fared today.